All right, so Pinocchio has been the hot ticket IP the last couple of years with animated and live action adaptations, but Netflix and Guillermo del Toro might have the best of the best on their hands with the latest stop motion animation musical take on the character, which differs quite a bit from the stereotypical Pinocchio story you've grown to know. So in this video, we're going to talk about Del Toro's inspiration for the story, how the ending differs, some of its themes, along with our reaction and review of this latest wooden boy turned human, or, or something kind of in the middle, Pinocchio movie. Now if you enjoy this video, then hit that like button as it helps the channel, I would not lie. And also don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns, recaps, and other videos like this every day. With that out of the way, a huge thank you for clicking this. I'm your host, Jared. Now let's get into Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Now, like I mentioned up top, del Toro's Pinocchio differs quite a bit from the other House of Mouse versions that you grew up with, you know, with Geppetto wishing upon a star, the wooden boy comes to life, and the pair get into all sorts of scrambles. Pinocchio! Father, when can I leave to be on my own? How did that get made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely different from that version as well. Instead, Del Toro adapted Grizz Grimley's designs from his 2002 edition of the 1883 Italian novel, The Adventures of Pinocchio by Carlo Collardi. And after looking at some of the illustrations of his book, Del Toro brought this into 3D stop motion flawlessly. Like even the puppet scenes here, that are at the carnival are ripped directly from the book. As for the 1883 Italian novel, yes, it does contain some of the familiar elements from the big budget adaptations of Pinocchio you may be used to, but with a slight twist. Del Toro simply uses the novel as a template, keeping some things while crafting his own unique take with other parts. Geppetto, Pinocchio, his nose growing, a cricket, the carnival, and giant dogfish instead of a whale are all carried over. Del Toro then adds a bit of Frankenstein's monster flair to Pinocchio, but one of the biggest changes implemented is the setting of 1930s Italy set during the Great War, or rather World War II. At this time, Italy is under fascist rule and plays into many of the iconic Pinocchio moments, such that Geppetto's son Carlo died in a bombing, which drives him to alcoholism and then building Pinocchio. This is a children's movie, right? <laughs> the young boys don't go off to some island and become donkeys, but rather go into a fascist youth organization camp because, get this, they think Pinocchio will make the perfect soldier because he can't die. And the ocean scenes feature dozens of naval mines that later dispatch the giant dogfish. Del Toro clearly has something to say, likening this to how children watched the original Disney adaptation and were to learn right from wrong. His version, though, is for children and adults to do the same. He even includes Benito Mussolini to not only fit the time setting, but to hilariously riff on him. Now, the ending is something I did not expect, but does tie in with the more realistic, raw, hey, this is a tragedy of life, my dude, approach. So the dogfish is exploded into a million pieces of sushi, sending Pinocchio and the gang soaring, resulting in the wooden boy dying for a third time. Pinocchio chooses to leave the underworld early in order to save Geppetto from drowning, therefore trading in his infinite lives to become mortal. This is the movie's take on the I'm a real boy now moment with him returning and saving Geppetto. However, in this selfless act, Pinocchio drowns and dies. The wood sprite shows up again apologizing to Geppetto that she really only wanted to bring him joy, which Pinocchio did. But now it's sorrow as Geppetto pleads with her to bring him back, but reveals Pinocchio gave his own life to save Geppetto's. Jay Cricket chimes in stating it's not fair that she had promised him one single wish if he had looked over Pinocchio and made sure he was a good boy and to do what was right. Sure, Cricket messed up a bit, but Pinocchio turned out to be better than a good boy and in turn taught Cricket what it was to be good. The Wood Sprite sees Cricket had accomplished what she had originally asked for and wishes Pinocchio back to life with the same spell she used in the beginning. Geppetto admits he learned something too. He shouldn't have been trying and trying to make Pinocchio into something he wasn't. 
He shouldn't have to be like Carlo or anyone else, but exactly who you are. One of the glaring main themes flowing through the story as Pinocchio comes back to life. Cricket, Spazzatura, Geppetto, and Pinocchio all celebrate his return, acknowledging life is such a wonderful gift. And a wonderful gift it is as slowly one by one Geppetto, Cricket, Spazzatura pass away with Pinocchio being there for their final moments. The two are buried next to Carlo's grave and Cricket in a black bunny matchbox living in Pinocchio's heart. What happens, happens, and then we are gone. As we see another pristine pine cone fall off of the tree. I'm, I'm, I'm not crying. You, you are. <laughs> Now, Del Toro's Pinocchio does have a mid credit scene, so don't get up off your couch and walk away just yet, as we see Sebastian J. Cricket in the afterlife playing cards with the black rabbits that were featured a handful of times when Pinocchio kept dying. It's a quick final check-in with the character, and if you could guess, the entire story is actually him recounting his life to the black rabbits, hence him being the, you know, narrator of the whole movie. It's a fun final nod to the character, but the reoccurring joke of Jay Cricket being interrupted before, what's that? No, 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 I'm, I'm telling everyone about the, you know, mid credit scene where Jay Cricket is revealed. Uh, <laughs> I see what you're doing. But Cricket finally gets his time to shine, singing his song that he had been interrupted time and time again while featuring his excellent dance moves. Where's Pinocchio to throw it down to? I will admit, despite this adaptation being in development hell for roughly a decade, it was well worth the wait and completely stands alone from other adaptations of the property, mainly because of its stop motion animation. The absolute detail, like, like the Count having a long pointy nose because he's also lying all the time, and small mannerisms of the characters and environments were seamless. I had many times completely forgot that this whole team had to rig this up and meticulously move everything centimeters to create this work of art. Another thing that makes this feel so unique is the time setting and events that Del Toro chose to feature. Ballsy is one way I'll describe it, especially the spotlight of the rise of fascism and government control, which is very much present still today. But it is also meaningful in multiple ways. Sure, it's an educational and lighter historical look at things, but also meshes well with the lessons Pinocchio needs to learn to become a real boy, become obedient in a sense. But also learning to question the way things are, go against the status quo, and realize what is important to a person and how those relationships can be lifelong. I'm getting real sappy with things, but I gotta give Del Toro's Pinocchio a solid 9 out of 10. Like I said, everything is hitting those unique beats that were very much appreciated, differing itself from the pile of other Pinocchios out there, and hit the feels. A perfect blend of Del Toro's lighter horror elements, like things get dark, yeah, I'm not kidding you, Candlewick's father tries to have him shoot Pinocchio point blank. Combined with the joyous, more light-hearted comedy, like I'm a sucker for a good fart song, don't get me wrong, so when Pinocchio was laying into Mussolini, I got a real kick out of its Terrence and Philip stylings. But there are a handful of other comedic moments that made me laugh, like the ship captain saluting Uriva Dochi right as they see the dogfish. The voice cast was spot on as well, really added a lot of personality. Christoph Waltz, mm, he was so good. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Del Toro's Pinocchio. Was the stop motion approach better than what anything the Mouse House has been shoveling out there? And I'll let you know, we're currently running a competition right now, giving away three copies of House of Dragons Season 1 on the 15th of December. And all you gotta do to get a chance of winning this is like this video, make sure to subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment down below with your thoughts of Pinocchio. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of last month are on screen right now. So if that's you, message us on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, be sure to check out some of our other cool videos. Our Transformers Rise of the Beast breakdown is massive, so enjoy. But with that out of the way, thank you for your comments constant support. I've been Jared, and remember, do not lie. And with that, I'll say bye-bye. <laughs> All right, take care. Peace.